Welcome everyone to day 10, our final day of EEI's fifth annual Global Electrification Forum, or GEF. My name is Vanessa Ferrero and I'm a manager for international programs at EEI. It has been a pleasure to be your MC throughout the GEF. Today's sessions are centered on leadership and innovation, two qualities we know will be critical on the path to 2050. We are excited to begin the day with a fireside chat on innovation, learning, and leadership, featuring Joelle Hellermark, the co-founder and CEO of Sauna Labs. Joelle will be joined in conversation by EEI Vice President for International Programs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Without further ado, please welcome Lawrence and Joelle to the stage for our first session of the day. Good evening, Joelle from Stockholm. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you so much for having me, Lawrence. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Well, we're going to jump straight into this conversation. We have 30 minutes and there's a lot to cover. Subject of leadership, innovation, and learning. So first of all, I've read about the company. We'll get to that later on. But I want to first start about you. Uh, you got interested in computer at a very early age, 13. What happened? What sparked your interest? So at, at that point, uh, uh, a lot of online courses started emerging. So you first had uh, Andrew Eng at, at Stanford starting to publish his computer science courses. And uh, I got very interested uh, in, uh, in initially recommender systems and machine learning. And, and through those courses, uh, taught myself uh, initially it was it was C and eventually uh, at 14 ended up landing a job as a software engineer and and I think what really sparked my interest about uh, about uh, software engineering is is the fact that they can run when you're sleeping so you could write these programs that would do the work for you while you were sleeping and that was such a powerful concept that uh, I could have a computer chess uh, against my friends that, that I had written. And, and ultimately, I think this, this concept of developing bicycles for the brain, I, I found very, very interesting. And, and the notion of bicycle uh, for, for the brain came from, from this uh, article in National Geographic that, that Steve Jobs read. And in, in this article, they ranked the energy efficiency of animals. And and humans were actually pretty bad uh, in terms of energy efficiency and, and came out, I think, 20th on, on, on that list. Uh, but the author was, was clever enough to, to make a measurement of humans on a bicycle because fundamentally we're tool builders. And, and then we came out first. And I thought that was so powerful that the notion that we could co sort of augment human intelligence and enhance human intelligence uh, by writing programs and 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 kind of got obsessed by that idea. Well, I think I think the obsession clearly has paid off because you're deeply entrenched in this whole idea of applying machine learning to uh, a, a sort of a further education. So, so tell me, uh, I, I did my research, Joel, and I know that you you spent some time in Cambridge. Uh, tell me what that meant, and, and talk a little bit about your interest in neuroscience. Of course. So um, as kind of, I was very into autodidacticism, teaching myself these concepts. And as a function of that, I also got very interested in how could I optimize this process and enhance learning, uh, which naturally led me to, to, to neuroscience. And um, specifically, I mean, memory plays such a core, core function in, in how we learn. Uh, anything we learn is just creating connections of incoming concepts to concepts we've, we've already mastered. Uh, so I specifically focused on, on, on memory and how memories are, are created and, and stored. And, and one very interesting concept that, that I stumbled upon in, in this process was the notion of spaced repetition. And the notion of spaced repetition is that if we just increase the intervals between that which we present information to a learner over time increasingly, then uh, the information will be stored in the long term in memory. And so rather than presenting five concepts all at once during one day, you presented it first one day, then after five days, uh, then after 10 days, and then after 20 days, and then after three months, and then it would be stored in the long term memory. And the, the evidence for this was extremely surprising. We could increase knowledge retention over three times by, by doing this. 
And then my question became, why? What, what's kind of the biological reason for, uh, for this? And it was tricky to, to find an answer, answer. So I think that's ultimately why, why I didn't become a neuroscientist, because I felt that there were more, more questions than answers. And I, I, I wanted to work, uh, move more towards the applied side. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. In fact, as you were talking, I was thinking about this year's Jeff. Uh, now that we thought about it as detail as you've said, but uh, instead of having the Jeff cramped into one day, we spread it across two weeks. So hopefully people are remembering what they've uh, heard of this Jeff as compared to previous Jeff when we had everyone in the room for like one or two days just going session after session after session. So let's get into the company. Before you start at Santa Labs, what was your first company? So I previously worked on video recommendation. So that was my first endeavor into starting a company. Uh, I was 16 at the, uh, at the time and uh, was very interested in, in both recommender systems and how can we create more personalized experiences. But also you had this wealth of video content across the web. And I, I looked into how can we make it more personalized and get the right uh, content to the right person at, at the right time. Uh, so that was my first uh, first company. and. And then eventually, I think a, a big, a big, uh, a big question for for me became, uh, what, what's the most important uh, problems that you could uh, could be work, working on? Um, and uh, video recommendations is, is arguably not as important as as what we're doing today. So uh, I was very excited to eventually move on to to grander challenges. Mm -hmm. So the idea of applying applying artificial intelligence, neuroscience, whatever you may. to solve is there any chance we're to do this um, you know the fact that you started this company before you came to Santa Lab, what experience did you have from starting the company at an early age? I mean you were 13 when you started the first one and you were 16. I mean what did you learn during that process that you're using now to make Santa Lab so successful? I think the the most important role that you could probably have as a as a leader is as a recruiter and uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, I think a big portion of what makes a company successful is it's, its value proposition to potential recruits. Uh, that's something that I really took with me uh, with Sana. Uh, we, in our recruiting process, we speak a lot about this Japanese concept of Ikigai. Uh, the concept is uh, essentially they studied uh, some of the happiest um, humans on, on earth and tried to figure out what were some of the commonalities. And the commonalities that they found was that there was a combination of them working on, on something that was meaningful to other people and could make a positive difference in the world, something that they were passionate about, something that they could uh, get, get paid for. And they did that with some world-class talent. And uh, we brought this concept to, to Sana extensively in that we wanted to build a culture where you can do, really do your life's work and work on your passions. Uh, we wanted to develop uh, a culture where you can make a positive difference uh, to, to the world by improving the way the world learns. Mm -hmm. And in a culture where, where you were working with some of the best people in each respective domain. And having such a clear value proposition against recruits ultimately uh, led to us uh, bringing in some of the best engineers from Google, from Spotify, um, people, some of the best designers in the world. And, and, and I think ultimately that's, that's what, uh, uh, what, what made us uh, successful. So um, I think the value proposition against recruits was one of my big main takeaways. I think it's a, it's a very interesting perspective, Joel, because oftentimes when you hear about value proposition, it's always about value proposition towards the customer. And I think the idea of developing value proposition towards the recruits is, is very important. Let's just stay on the issue of education. Um, so personalized learning is seem to be very interesting. What are the advantages and disadvantages you think between the personal learning experience and the traditional sort of a curriculum based classroom type that we've all been accustomed to for decades? What's the difference? What the advantages with the personal one? Of course. So, so what led me to, to learning then eventually was I was very into kind of Buckminster Fuller's philosophy. And Bucky uh, spoke a lot about meta problems. And meta problems were the problems that if you improve those problems, you 
it has cascade effects in essentially every single industry. So by improving learning, we can see fundamentally new breakthroughs in, in science, uh, we can provide economical empowerment and, and so on. So I got really passionate about learning. And, and when, it, when I was thinking about learning, it to a large extent had this one size fits all approach. Everyone got the exact same content in the exact same way, independently of their individual challenges and their individual knowledge gaps. And learning has arguably never been more important. We uh, face uh, over 50% of the global workforce needing significant upskilling and reskilling. And these legacy tools that are one size fits all and disengaging uh, won't work if we're going to upskill our, our, our global workforce. Mm -hmm. So there we started looking at how can we apply the best from learning sciences in applying the science of how we actually learn uh, uh, with machine learning to create fundamentally more effective and engaging uh, learning experiences. Mm -hmm. And what that resulted in was essentially the SANA platform. And, and as a learner, what the SANA platform does is that it measures the concepts that you already know. Uh, creates a very detailed profile of what skills you have and also what skill gaps you have. It then personalizes the learning experience to your individual knowledge gaps um, and then nudges you over time to create this long-term memory retention. Mm -hmm. And the advantages of that we're seeing is that companies are uh, upskilling their workforce up to 50% faster. Information is retained over three times longer and learners are staying significantly more engaged. So there's a lot of advantages to, to that approach as compared to the one size fits all. And I'm extremely excited about what would happen if we empowered every single uh, learner with that on a global scale. What would be the effect if we could improve learning outcomes by over 50% on a, on a global level? So for full disclosure, I am a fan of Santa Labs. I do love the platform, but I'm still it's my responsibility here to push back and ask a question. What is the disadvantage? Because I'm sure there are people who will say, yes, you know, Joel, all this personal learning is great, but you still need to develop other sort of skills, like, you know, interpersonal skills and all of that. So what are some of the, what is one sort of a disadvantage you would see that would probably make us think about mar marrying the personal learning with the conventional learning? Is there any disadvantage? What do you lose by going down the route of having a personal learning experience? Of course, so I think to a large extent, and then it's a complement and not the replacement. And uh, the experiences are, are really at the very heart of learning. So what, what you see generally with kind of personalized learning programs or personalized learning assistants that, that teach you, that they're very good at the fundamental levels of, let's say, like Bloom's taxonomy, where you have understanding, um, uh, uh, remembering, analyzing, applying but then when it comes to more the creative skills or the interpersonal skills that's where it's much better taught in a live environment and and what we found is that by by increasing the conceptual understanding that also increases the the leverage in, in more of the interpersonal interaction so if you can come in advance of a workshop and, and you already know the core basics uh, that also increases the value of, 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 of the subsequent uh, teaching methods. Uh, yeah. But you're very accurate in that this is not a silver bullet, but something that should be combined with, with live, uh, live classes, interactions, and, and other types of, of teaching. Okay, so we, we're halfway in the conversation. We have about 15 more minutes left, but uh, I'm going to try to give you some one answer question or one word answer for this question. Uh, just tell us what one word describes your leadership philosophy? Just one or two words to describe your leadership philosophy. Mm, can I have two? Yes, two. <laughs> uh, so like the pragmatic dreamer. Pragmatic dreamer, I, I like that. Dream and imagination go together and it's important for creativity. Perfect, pragmatic dreamer. Okay, other thing, team building. You talk about your team. Uh, interpersonal, inter interdisciplinary team. What would tell? What would be one main advantage of building interdisciplinary teams? Um, finding intersections of, of different disciplines to come up with fundamentally new ways of, of solving problems. And there's this one book that I was extremely inspired by before I founded Sana, which is called Organizing Genius, and it describes the Manhattan Project. Uh, 
Um, it describes the uh, Macintosh, uh, the campaign that got Clinton elected. The, it describes uh, Disney in the early days and a couple of other great groups in, in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the core uh, common denominators was uh, interdisciplinarianism. Hmm. I like that. I like the idea because I, I strongly believe in systems thinking to solve some of the big problems. And I think putting together interdisciplinary teams are very, very important. Okay, let's move on. You have received a lot of recognitions uh, given your early where you are in your career. Uh, you were the top, you know, top sweet, top talent in Sweden in, in 2018 by Beckham's Affair. Uh, Guardian named you 10, 10 people on the 25 to pay attention to in the world who's making the world a better place. Forbes this year, not a few weeks ago, had you on the list of 30 under 30. But yet and still, you seem to be a very calm, down-to-earth kind of guy. So let me just ask you, now, is it because of the Swedish culture concept that talks about Jan Tilog, or is it because of your family upbringing, or is this all of the above? Why are you still kind of relaxed? I know you're even, you're even part of the Obama Foundation, Leadership Foundation, but you're still a very calm, cool, approachable guy. So why haven't your head grown bigger because of all the egos that people at your age may have? No, I very much consider myself a, a work in, in progress. And, uh, and uh, I, I think like I'm, I'm only getting started and uh, I'm still just a kid trying to uh, make sense of the world and develop my, my leadership. So um, I, I think it's very kind of you to say so, but uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still very much a work in progress and I'm just very excited to, to get the opportunity to, to learn from my team and, and learn from some of the best people in, in the industry and, and become a, a better leader and, and hopefully uh, make a, a bigger difference to the world. So yeah, I very much consider myself a work in progress. So I, I struggle to take, uh, take these awards or so to, to heart. <laughs> Well, uh, it's great to hear that. I'm sure that will make your parents and grandparents and everybody else proud. And it makes me humble to know that there are people like you who want to make a difference. In fact, let me just say what, what uh, Forbes said. Forbes' statement for why they put you on that list, because you are systematically and sustainably trying to transform business and education. So talking about business and leadership, uh, tell me, uh, name one business leader and one political leader who you think have shaped your thinking um, so I think one um, one business leader that I've been very inspired by um, is Edwin Land, uh, the founder of Polaroid, and and it was that interdisciplinary work that they uh, that they did at Polaroid, where they brought together some of the best chemists in the, in the world with industrial designers to create this consumer grade product and. Uh, Edwin uh, always uh, led with that interdisciplinary thinking. He was both a chemist and a businessman. Um, and then Buckminster Fuller, uh, of course, uh, although he was maybe not a businessman, but somewhat of kind of a philosopher, architect, inventor, uh, however you want to describe him. I think he had a, a very um, pragmatic approach of, of of looking at how to make a positive difference in, in the world. And, and that really resonated uh, uh, with me. And in terms of political leaders, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to, to learn from, from President Obama and, and he inspires me a lot. And a, a big thing that, that I took away from my interactions with, with him has, has been uh, his empathy and his ability to empathize with, with groups. And that's so important when you're developing a, a product, but but also an organization is uh, the ability to, to understand your, your users and, and understand the needs of, of your team. And, and there's a lot of uh, good uh, nuggets from, from him that I think about very frequently. It's very good, very good. Uh, great. I mean, we're, we're right on time, so we got about three more questions, and we might, we might, we might beat the control room is telling me that uh, I have 10 minutes left, so I'm, I'm excited because we still have a few more things to cover. So the theme of this conference, uh, Joel, is uh, Destination 2050. And, and we know the governments of Sweden, the United States, yesterday everyone made declarations about climate change, trying to get the world to net zero. But we know that in 2050, uh, the world will be governed mostly by millennials and by Generation Z. So, 
how will artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, affect how these groups, millennials and Generation Z, who will be governing? How do you think AI is going to affect them when they start governing and running the world? I think one big difference will be more data-driven uh, leadership uh, over, over time. And uh, also potentially the ability to simulate situations more accurately uh, before, before they happen. Um, also, I think the, the, the ab ability to model, uh, model and simulate different, different scenarios and then optimize your decisions based on that will be extremely powerful and uh, a, a, a good uh, uh, method to use once you're making Im important uh, decisions. Um, so that's something that uh, I, I think will be very intriguing to, to see o over time, uh, how, how we can use these methods uh, more, more effectively. Um, I think personally, how, how we use it in, 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 our, in, in our work um, also in, in, in terms of leadership is also to spot a lot of anomalies and, and uh, get actionable insights on how to act on them. So we might figure that there's a specific drop somewhere in uh, our employee engagement data, for example, and then we have a system that automatically nudges us on a few suggested actions on, on how to act on top of that data, and we can select the one that makes the most sense for, uh, for us. Mm -hmm. So it's really enhancing the leadership, and, 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 and ultimately what I'm hoping to do, uh, hoping that can, can achieve is bring world-class data-driven leadership to everyone and kind of nudge them mm -hmm. to more positive uh, behavior. Uh, but it's a very good question. I haven't thought about it much before, but potentially we will see very different types of leaders uh, as they become AI enhanced. Yeah, and you know, you, you know, I, I'm I'm always intrigued by the whole you know digital twin. I mean, in the energy industry, we spend a lot of time looking at digitalization. And one of the reasons I wanted to invite you to talk to our audience is because I think learning is going to be critical as we move to the net zero world. We're going to have to upskill, reskill, uh, and, and really modernize the workforce in the energy industry. So I think having you here is very important. Just quickly, can you just give me one example? I would love you to say very briefly about the New York example. How was Sana Lab platform used during the COVID-19? Because I think it's a very interesting story. Can you just quickly give me, give the audience a feel of how you guys were able to use this tool to make a difference in the world? Of course, so during the pandemic, we had a huge challenge in upskilling our global workforce and uh, health workforce. And, and what we had to do is teach them everything from mechanical ventilators to treatment and prevention of, of COVID-19. Uh, what SANA enabled uh, the hospitals to do, we worked with over 2,000 hospitals, is to do that in a personalized way. Every single nurse started uh, with different knowledge gaps, with different challenges, and SANA could then personalize the content to their individual challenges. So if you take the work we did with Mount Sinai in New York, for example, um, we first measured what the nurse already knew. Then we were able to create the personalized pathway of content that they had to master. Uh, we then reminded them over time to create long-term memory retention. And ultimately, they could reduce the onboarding time of new nurses by 37%. Um, and uh, we, during the pandemic, trained over 80,000 health workers. And, and it, it, was, it was quite incredible to see uh, the partnership between us as a private technology company and, 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 and others to bring state-of-the-art technology to this grand, grand challenge and, and make a positive difference. Yeah, I think, they, I think applying it to grand challenges like the pandemic, I think is a very uh, sort of an inspirational and intriguing uh, uh, um, application of the platform. Um, and, and honestly, I think in the energy industry, we certainly uh, would want to look at this kind of a platform to think of how we're going to transition the workforce. Because uh, one of the challenges uh, we face as an industry, as you start to decarbonize, there are those who are concerned about losing jobs, right? But yeah. then there's also the opportunity to upskill and reskill people. So this platform could be very helpful. Well, two more quick questions. We have about five minutes left here, Joel. Uh, uh, so, you know, getting to 2050 has a lot of uncertainties. We have a lot of, you know, uh, predictions about what's going to happen. What is your vision 
uh, for Santa Labs uh, and for personal learning over the next, say, uh, three decades? I'm hoping for a ubiquitous personalized learning assistant that knows exactly what you know, knows exactly how you learn, and can take you from whatever knowledge you have today to whatever knowledge you need in, in the future in the most efficient and engaging manner. And my, my, my vision for the impact of, of that is, if you look at historically, so we first had kind of the printing press that allowed us to scale up uh, the production of, of these texts at, at, at scale and provide exact same information kind of at, at scale. And we saw everything that, that came as a, as a function function of that. And, and then we had the internet that did much the same thing, but at a larger scale, uh, took the same content and then replicated it at, at scale. But to a large extent, the way we learn has, has remained quite similar. We still present the exact same information in the exact same way to everyone. Now we have the opportunity to create much more personalized experiences that are targeting exactly uh, how you learn or targeting exactly what you know. And, and ultimately, I'm, I'm hopeful that that could lead to, to similar effects eventually. It can accelerate our uh, transition to renewable energy, it can um, help us develop medicines faster by uh, using data more effectively, and it can help us improve the quality of, of, of healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, so ubiquitous personalized learning assistance that's radically improving every aspect of our, our, our lives is, is uh, a 2050 vision that I'm in, inspired to share. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good vision because I can tell you there's a market for it. And, and, and leaving the energy space, one other question before I ask you my absolute last question is how does this platform, how can it be used, say, in the developing world in Africa, uh, in Latin America, where there are young people who are hungry to learn is there an, an attitude towards, not an attitude, is there an approach to how you can sort of, when you talk about ubiquitous, how can we make it affordable for people in Africa and, and Asia and other parts of the world? Have you given that some thought? We're a highly mission-driven organization, meaning that we jump at every opportunity in, in which we think we can make a difference through learning. And there's been a couple of examples there where we've been able to contribute. For example, in, in language learning, we. We work with refugee camps in, in uh, helping learners uh, and immigrants learn the native language. We, uh, we partner up um, uh, with others to provide personalized math education um, mm -hmm. that can give you high quality personalized learning at, at scale uh, and for free. Um, so I think there are multiple examples and, and um, and, and really what, what we see as a function of that is, uh, is re reading literacy, math literacy, that's the core driver of economical uh, empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it will be so powerful over the next decade as we see these technologies becoming ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Well, one, I said I had one last question, but when you answered the question, you prompted me to ask you another one quickly. We have about two minutes left. Uh, so in terms of your customers, I noticed that IKEA is one of your customers. So, so tell me. What would the company, you have such a diverse set of customers, Mount Sinai, New York, IKEA, Pepsi Cola. What's common to all of those different organizations? They are making big bets on improving the way their organizations learn. And one of the benefits of the SANA platform is that it's content agnostic in that it can help uh, teach everything from math to data, uh, to um, onboarding a new uh, nurse uh, at, at the hospital and whatever you put into it, it, it models and, and personalizes that e experience. So I think what they all have in common is, is that they've realized that the organizations that learn faster are, are gonna be the ones that, that win uh, ultimately um, and placing a bet on more efficient learning tools is, is, is a good strategy. Well, we're, we are going to place a bet on e efficient learning tools in the energy sector because we have a job, our job cut off for us. We have between now and 2050 to make a huge difference. Last question. We started off talking about uh, neuroscience and we got into this idea of artificial intelligence. And you use one word that prompted my thinking. You said chess. If we had more time, I would love for us to play a game of chess, but we don't have enough time because we have to leave in the next 30 seconds. But let me give you one last question. Tell me who in your mind, if you had a chance to play chess one-on-one, 
Let me give you five names and tell me who you would choose and why. Kasparov, Karpov, Carlson, Steinitz, and someone not too far from where you are, Grandilios. Which of those five guys would you like to meet one-on-one? -on -one? If you want to play me, that's fine. You don't have to play me. But if you have to choose between the five guys I just mentioned, who would you choose and why? Carlson. And Carlson is one of the few remaining chess players that still plays chess intuitively. Many of the others have just memorized uh, how uh, computers play chess. So Carlson is arguably the only remaining human chess player. And uh, I'd be excited to test the limits of human chess playing today. Okay, well, listen, on that note, I will tell Gary Kasparov that you turn him down. You didn't want to play me, but you would rather play Carlson, and you also turned me down, which is, trust me, the best thing you did because you would have lost. <laughs> anyway, Joel, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for coming to join, spend some time with us here, and we hope to have you back at the next, Jeff, and give us more information how we can make advantage, take advantage of this new platform. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks a lot. This was good fun. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joelle and Lawrence, for an insightful conversation on how we can be better learners as we navigate the path to 2050. Interdisciplinary thinking will certainly be important as we continue to tackle global challenges.